One time my boyfriend and I went with his cousins who live in Dallas to a casino in Oklahoma. We had reserved an Airbnb for the night, which was about 30 minutes from the actual casino itself. It was just cheaper, and there were about 11 people in total. Red flag number one. The route itself was off-road, and we were driving all over gravel and rocks. Had no clue where we were going due to it being pitch black and us being nowhere. Red flag number two. When we got there, we found out the owner of the house was actually living in the house, in the top floor all by himself. The actual house was on a huge piece of land, and it looked as if we wouldn't receive any help if anything were to happen to us. After finding out he was living upstairs, we all started to feel creeped out, like there were eyes watching us, and just an uncomfortable feeling altogether. Red flag number three. When we got there, there was no space at all for 11 people to sleep as the ad had suggested. So half the group decided to go find a hotel someplace else to sleep, while the other half decided to stay. There were beds in the middle of the hallways and random beds all over the place. The ad for the Airbnb wasn't what we had gotten. Behind one of the beds we saw a mini staircase leading upstairs. After all of that, we had decided to cut our losses and go get a hotel room where the other half of the group was. Grabbing our things, we all jumped back into the car and didn't feel safe again until we got on to an actual road. We lost $193, but we most definitely kept our lives. It had been a grueling week and I was more than ready to escape to the Colorado mountains for a few days. The Airbnb I found was perfect. An old, secluded cabin, miles from the nearest town, promising peace, quiet, and most importantly, solitude. I arrived at dusk. The cabin stood alone against the backdrop of towering pines and mist, looking almost out of place with its faded paint and creaking wooden steps. A small note had been left for me under the stone frog on the front porch. Welcome, make yourself at home. I'm away, so reach out by phone if you need anything. Edwin. The host, Edwin, had assured me through messages that he would be out of town for the weekend. I appreciated the privacy, but there was something oddly personal about the place. The walls were covered with family photos from the 80s and 90s, Stiff portraits of people I didn't know, unsmiling children, and stiff-lipped adults staring out of sepia-toned frames. I unpacked and settled in, enjoying the silence that stretched on for miles. But as night fell, I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. The house creaked and groaned, and shadows seemed to linger just out of sight. The next morning, I decided to head into town to stock up on supplies. As I wandered the aisles of the local grocery store, I saw a familiar face peering at me from behind a stack of canned goods. It was Edwin, or at least it looked like him. He was watching me intently, his eyes cold and calculating. Hey, I greeted surprised. I thought you were out of town. For a moment he looked startled, as if he hadn't expected me to speak. Out of town, he murmured frowning. Yes, yes I am. His words made no sense, and he quickly ducked his head and shuffled off, disappearing into another aisle. I shrugged it off, assuming I'd misinterpreted our conversation. Maybe he was back in town early. But as I paid for my groceries, I spotted him again, this time lingering near the door, staring at me with an intensity that was unnerving. Before I could approach, he turned and slipped out of sight. That evening, as I was cooking dinner, I heard a knock at the front door. My heart leapt. I wasn't expecting anyone, and the cabin was miles from the main road. I opened the door cautiously, and there stood Edwin, looking disheveled and panicked. He glanced over his shoulder, as if expecting someone. Or something. To be following him. You shouldn't be here, he whispered, his voice urgent. It. It's not safe for you. I frowned. What do you mean? I booked this place days ago, and you approved it. Are you okay? Edwin's eyes darted around, his hand gripping the doorframe as if he needed to hold himself upright. It's happening again, he muttered. Every time. 
Every time, they never listen. Every time what? I asked, now more confused than ever. Without another word, he turned and strode off into the woods, his figure swallowed by the encroaching darkness. I stared after him, a chill running through me. What did he mean? Every time. What was he talking about? The next morning, I decided to search the cabin for any clues that might explain Edwin's strange behavior. I went through drawers and cupboards, hoping for something. Anything. That would make sense of the last two days. Finally, in the back of a cabinet, I found a tattered journal. The cover was faded, and the pages inside were yellowed with age. As I opened it, the scent of mildew hit me, and I could see handwritten notes scrawled in a frantic, looping script. It was Edwin's handwriting. Most of it was illegible, but a few phrases jumped out. Trapped here again and again. Death is a door. They come to take me each night. My heart raced as I pieced together the words. From the journal, it seemed Edwin believed he was caught in some kind of loop, a pattern that repeated with each new visitor. And then, scrawled on the final page, was a message that sent a shiver down my spine. Warning to all who stay, do not speak to him if you see him. You may end up like me. That night, I lay awake, barely daring to breathe. Outside, the wind howled, and the cabin creaked as if straining against some unseen force. I could feel an oppressive weight in the air, and my mind raced with thoughts of Edwin's journal, his cryptic warnings, and his strange behavior. Around midnight, I heard footsteps on the porch. I held my breath, clutching the blanket close. The steps moved slowly, as though someone were pacing back and forth, each step heavy with purpose. Suddenly, there was a sharp knock on the door, followed by Edwin's voice, low and desperate. Please let me in, he pleaded. I can explain everything. I... I can't keep doing this alone. Against my better judgment, I crept to the door, peering through the peephole. Edwin stood there, his face twisted with a mixture of fear and exhaustion. Please, he repeated, his voice breaking. Help me. Don't leave me here alone again. In that moment, a terrible thought struck me. What if Edwin wasn't asking for company? What if he was asking for something far darker, something he'd hidden in that journal? The next day, determined to find answers, I drove back into town. After a few inquiries, I learned that Edwin had been dead for over 20 years. He had once owned the cabin, but after a tragic accident, he'd perished on its very grounds his body found at the bottom of the mountain after a suspected fall. Ever since, people had reported strange sightings of him, claiming to have seen him walking through town, just as I had. The locals, I was told, had come to think of Edwin as the ghost who wouldn't leave. Terrified, I hurried back to the cabin, desperate to gather my things and leave. But as I packed, I felt a creeping sense of dread. I was starting to understand Edwin's warning, if he was truly reliving his death, night after night, was I a part of his cycle now? The air in the cabin grew thick, and shadows stretched across the walls, taking on shapes that seemed almost human. Night fell once more, and I knew I had only one chance to escape. If I could avoid Edwin's ghost until morning, I might break free from his twisted cycle. I sat huddled in the corner of the bedroom, the journal clutched in my hands, repeating to myself that I would not listen. I would not answer. Around midnight, the footsteps returned. I heard him pacing, knocking on the door, calling my name, his voice growing louder and more desperate with each passing hour. Please, don't leave me here, he begged, his voice trembling. You don't know what it's like to be trapped. Alone. I squeezed my eyes shut, fighting the urge to respond. But as dawn began to break, his voice took on a chilling finality. If you won't help me, he whispered, you will replace me. And then, just as quickly as it had started, the knocking stopped. The air grew still, and the first light of morning spilled through the window. I didn't waste a second. I threw my bags into the car and sped down the mountain road, feeling the oppressive weight lift the further I got from the cabin. I didn't look back, afraid that I might see Edwin's figure watching me from the porch. In the weeks that followed, I couldn't shake the feeling that something still lingered. I'd find myself looking over my shoulder, 
feeling a presence that wasn't there. And sometimes, late at night, I'd hear a faint, desperate knock on my door, as though he had followed me back, pleading for release from a torment that would never end. I escaped Edwin's loop, but I knew he would always be waiting, seeking another visitor who might, in their compassion, listen to his pleas, and maybe someday answer. Me and my wife, we stayed in an Airbnb house for around a year about 950 a month. It had a total of seven rooms, and the washer and dryer was outside. We both traveled to different places, so we was really never home. Well, one day we get home, and she puts the clothes to wash outside. We get caught up and time passes by. It's nighttime. She tells me she's going out the clothes in the dryer. I have this disturbing feeling, so I go do it instead. Well, it's around 1 a.m. I'm bending over putting the clothes in the dryer. I look over, and there is blonde-haired dude staring about 10 feet away. So I stand up and ask him what's up, and if he is renting out a room or something. He immediately responds, Oh, I didn't see you there. You was just staring at me. Then he tells me no, he is from like 5 hours away, and is just passing through. I went inside after that. I stayed at an Airbnb in Venice, Italy where I'm pretty sure there was a guy who was an indentured servant or something. When we arrived at the Airbnb, we called the host we'll call her Juliana for this to let her know, and she responded that Jack not his real name would let us in. We waited outside for 30 minutes, but could see someone moving around inside. When he finally opened the door he told us he didn't speak English or Italian, just German. He gave us a key for the front door, and showed us our room up some sketchy stairs. The room was just a sliding piece of plywood with one lock on the inside. So you could lock yourself in the room, but not lock it once you left. We saw the actual host maybe one time, but she was usually out. One time, while waiting in the living room for my partner to get ready, I saw that there appeared to be a little room underneath the stairs. It was hard to see because there was no window in the room, and almost no light from the dark living room reached it. As I walked closer, I saw just a mattress on the floor and some newspapers in a pile. It looked almost as if someone was squatting there. I must have been staring at the room for like 30 seconds before I noticed Jack standing on the opposite side of the living room. He must have come down the stairs so quietly that I didn't even notice. I got very embarrassed that I had been caught snooping, apologized, and then moved outside to wait for my partner. When it came to leave a review, I was curious what other people had said about this place. Overall I hated staying there, it smelled, I didn't feel safe with the locks, it was noisy, etc. But the other reviews kept referring to the host as a luck, and how welcoming he was, and that he spoke great English. I was confused as my host was a woman and I never met anyone named Alok. I went ahead and left my review for the host on my listing. Fast forward a week or so, and I get a very angry message from my host, Juliana, on WhatsApp saying that I damaged her apartment and need to send her money ASAP. I responded asking for more details and how she knew I damaged it after I hadn't stayed there for a week. She told me that she had video evidence showing me doing something ridiculous like punching holes in the her window screen work, and that the damage had only occurred in the room I had been staying in. I knew this was a lie, why would I punch a screen? But it freaked me out that she implied she had something that could have been recording me without my permission or knowledge. I told her to stop messaging me and blocked her, and thankfully never heard from her again. If it's allowed, I can share the posting. I hope no one ever stays with here again. We've been planning this trip for months. A weekend escape to the secluded countryside, tucked away in a sprawling estate with creaky wooden floors, high archways, and a view that went on for miles. The listing described it as rustic, peaceful, and historic perfect for unwinding and forgetting about the stresses of daily life. 
our group. Me, Lisa, Sam, and Jamie couldn't wait to start exploring. From the moment we pulled up, the house felt different, the kind of place that holds stories. Even the air around it seemed charged, almost like the house was watching us, waiting for us to step inside. When we finally did, the house seemed both vast and endless. The furniture was vintage, upholstered in dark greens and maroons, and the walls were lined with ornate sconces that flickered in the evening light. We settled in and unpacked, excited about our weekend of no schedules, no work, and nothing but time together. The first night, after dinner and a few rounds of drinks, Lisa stumbled across something strange. Guys, look at this, she called, her voice carrying through the narrow hall. We all followed, curious. In a dark corner behind an old tapestry, Lisa had found a door, half hidden and painted to blend in with the wall. Jamie reached out, twisting the doorknob. It must have been for the servants or something, he said, pushing it open to reveal a narrow staircase descending into the shadows below. Let's check it out, Sam suggested, grabbing a flashlight from his bag. We huddled together and started down the stairs, our footsteps echoing in the quiet. The staircase was steep and claustrophobic, leading us to what felt like an entirely different section of the house. The walls were lined with old, peeling wallpaper, and the smell of dust and mildew filled the air. At the bottom of the stairs, we came upon a small hallway that branched off into several rooms, each with a different color and aura. The rooms were surprisingly well kept, with furniture and belongings left as if someone had just stepped out. The first door on the left was slightly open. Sam pushed it, and we found ourselves in a bedroom with outdated decor. A bed covered in lace, an old-fashioned vanity, and a faded quilt. Feels like a museum, Jamie murmured, running his fingers over the quilt. But as we explored the other rooms, we realized that each seemed to hold relics from different decades. One from the 50s, another from the 70s. The clothes, photos, and furniture looked like they belonged to a different era, frozen in time, as if whoever lived there had left everything exactly as it was. Each room felt strangely personal, like stepping into someone's memory. We wandered through, each finding ourselves pulled to different spaces. Lisa was captivated by a room from the 1920s, with elegant, fringed dresses, mirrors rimmed in tarnished gold, and perfume bottles lining a delicate vanity. She ran her fingers over a silk gown, marveling at the texture and intricate design. Can you believe someone actually wore this? she asked holding the dress up to herself and looking in the mirror. Meanwhile, Jamie was drawn to a room filled with rugged flannel shirts, hiking boots, and old outdoor gear. He chuckled, looking through a stack of faded magazines. Feels like this room was made for me, he said, his voice echoing slightly. Sam wandered into a room that looked like it was from the 1960s, complete with vinyl records, old posters, and a lava lamp. He smiled, flipping through the vinyl, his face lighting up as he found old classics. And then I found a room that felt familiar. There was an old typewriter on a desk, an ashtray filled with cigarette butts, and a stack of old journals. I ran my fingers over the typewriter keys, a sense of deja vu washing over me. It was as if the room was calling to me, and for a moment I felt like I belonged there. That night, back in our shared space, things felt tense. Lisa mentioned that she felt like someone had been watching her in the 1920s room. Did anyone else get that feeling, she asked, her voice hushed. We all exchanged uneasy glances. Jamie admitted he'd felt it too, a strange presence lingering just out of sight. Maybe it's just because it's so old and abandoned, I said, trying to shake off the creeping unease. But then we started hearing noises. Soft whispers like a distant conversation we couldn't quite make out. We dismissed it at first, telling ourselves it was just the house settling. But then, in the dead of night, we heard scratching coming from behind the walls. Sam was the first to try and brush it off. It's probably squirrels or something, he said, but even he looked uncertain. The next day, curiosity got the better of us, and we went back down to the hidden rooms. This time, though, each of us seemed magnetically drawn to the same room as before. 
Sam was flipping through old records, Lisa was trying on dresses, Jamie was looking through hiking gear, and I was tapping away at the typewriter. As the hours passed, we lost track of time, each of us absorbed by the lives these rooms seemed to hold. I found myself reading the journals left on the desk, catching glimpses of the writer's thoughts and experiences. They spoke of isolation, of feeling watched, and of a strange compulsion to stay. It felt like the room was shaping itself around me, catering to my interests and pulling me deeper into its grasp. That night, Sam came to us with a look of horror in his eyes. I... I was looking at the photos on the wall, he stammered, holding up a faded picture frame. We gathered around him, staring at the photograph. It showed a group of people, four friends, standing together in front of the house. They looked strikingly similar to us, right down to the expressions on their faces. There's more, he whispered, flipping through the pages of an old diary he'd found. It detailed a group of friends who had come to the house decades ago and had gone missing, their belongings left exactly as they were. The realization hit us all at once. The rooms were tailored for each of us. They were recreations of our lives, luring us in, trapping us in memories that were not our own. Panic set in and we tried to leave, but the hidden staircase seemed longer and darker than before. Every step felt like a fight, as if the house itself was resisting us. Shadows moved along the walls, and the whispers grew louder, more insistent, as if begging us to stay. Finally, we made it back to the main floor, but the air felt thick heavy, as if something didn't want us to leave. We need to get out now, Lisa whispered, her voice trembling. We sprinted for the door, but just as we reached it, we heard the faint sound of music drifting up from the hidden rooms. A haunting melody that filled us with a sense of longing and dread. As we drove away, the tension in the car was palpable. None of us spoke, the silence stretching thin between us. But as the house faded from view in the rearview mirror, I caught sight of something that sent a chill down my spine. In the back seat, resting innocuously, was the old typewriter I'd been using in my room. Next to it were a pair of Lisa's dresses, Jamie's hiking boots, and Sam's records. The house had let us go, but it had taken something of ours. Something personal, something that tied us to it. And I couldn't shake the feeling that someday, we'd find ourselves drawn back to that house, as if an invisible thread were pulling us toward our own room in that hidden place waiting patiently for us to return and become part of its memories forever. I've used Airbnb all over the world for the last six years and have loved the majority of my experiences. However, I had one Airbnb experience in Barcelona that made me seriously reconsider using the site again. I booked two Airbnbs for our Spain trip, one in Madrid, which was wonderful, and one in Barcelona. When we got to the Barcelona Airbnb after a long day of traveling, we were greeted by someone who wasn't the host from the site, were checked into a completely different apartment from the one in the photos on the Airbnb listing, and discovered that the listing is basically a hostel run by a company, not the individual private residence it seemed to be on the site. This apartment had a broken shower head, was incredibly loud people screaming on the street until 4 a.m. sounded like they were in our room, and had a bed that was so rock hard that at first I suspected it was just a box spring. There was only a top sheet provided no comforter, duvet, etc. When we went hunting for one, I found a duvet stuffed into a closet. It smelled like vomit and was stained. I contacted Airbnb about this bait and switch and the conditions. I took photos and I sent them to our assigned case manager. After she did some research, for three hours she called me back and said what they had done wasn't against Airbnb's policies and there was nothing they could do. This includes refusing to issue me any kind of refund. I checked us out of that Airbnb the next day and rented a place at the De La Flats Central Barcelona instead which I highly recommend. I was fortunate enough to have never needed the company to intervene before that incident. I had to put this story on three different social media platforms and tag them before they resolved the situation, 
and even that was shady they took down the profile of the person and the listing before I contacted them about it via social media. Which I realized because I went to leave them a scathing negative review and discovered the listing no longer existed. This means they looked into the complaint and agreed with me that it was a false listing and took it down, but didn't reach out to me to do anything about my experience until I publicly called them out for not helping me. I ended up getting a full refund after that, but it made me wary of dealing with them if something is wrong. Clearly you have to call and also put it out on social media before they'll help you. When I first arrived at the Airbnb, I was exhausted from traveling, just ready to settle in and get some rest. My host greeted me at the door with a friendly enough demeanor, but something about his eagerness gave me a slight pause. He asked for my passport to check my identity, which seemed normal enough for an Airbnb, but then he added a strange request. I'll need you to hold your passport and look directly at me, he said. I just need a quick picture of you holding it for security purposes. The request threw me off. I'd stayed in plenty of Airbnbs before, and none had asked me to pose with my passport. I thought about pushing back, but didn't want to start the trip with a confrontation. So reluctantly, I held my passport up and let him snap a photo, hoping I could put it behind me and enjoy my stay. The place itself was modest, nothing fancy. But after traveling all day, I was just grateful for a bed, a shower, and the promise of a decent night's sleep. I didn't think much more about the odd check-in experience until the next day. I'd woken up early, the summer sun already streaming through the thin curtains. The room was stuffy, so I reached for the air conditioning remote, hoping for some relief. As I looked up at the air conditioning unit on the wall, something caught my eye. At first, I thought I was seeing things. But as I looked closer, I noticed the glint of a small lens embedded near the corner of the unit. I felt a chill spread down my spine. It was unmistakably a camera, and it was on. The tiny light at the base was illuminated, a silent, chilling reminder that it was actively recording. I stood there, feeling a wave of shock and anger wash over me. My mind raced. I'd assumed this was a private space. The thought that he'd been watching. Or worse, recording. Me without my knowledge sent a sick feeling into my gut. I'd changed clothes in that room, spent time lounging around in whatever I felt comfortable in, assuming I was alone. Trying to keep my composure, I went downstairs and found him. He was sitting at the kitchen table, scrolling through his phone as if nothing was out of the ordinary. Is there a reason there's a camera in my room? I asked, my voice more accusatory than I'd intended. He looked up, a flash of surprise in his eyes, but quickly composed himself. Ah, yes, of course, he replied smoothly. We've had some issues with theft here. It's for everyone's safety, you understand. But his response only fueled my frustration. Theft. It was clear the camera wasn't pointed anywhere near the door or any entry point. It was aimed squarely at the bed, capturing the entire room. His explanation felt flimsy, almost as if he'd come up with it on the spot. I pressed him further, my suspicions only deepening. If you're worried about theft, why not have cameras by the entrances or in common areas? I asked, my voice sharper now. There's no reason to have one in a private room where guests are staying. He hesitated, looking for words, but ultimately shrugged. Look, it's for security. If it makes you uncomfortable, I can turn it off. He offered, almost dismissively, as if it were no big deal. The nonchalance in his response was infuriating. It was clear he didn't fully understand, or didn't care, just how invasive it felt. For the rest of my stay, I felt on edge, unable to shake the discomfort and unease. Even with the camera supposedly off, I couldn't bring myself to relax. Every glance at the air conditioning unit, every quiet moment in the room, I wondered if he'd simply switched it back on the moment I wasn't looking. The more I thought about it, the angrier I became. Here I was, in what was supposed to be a private, secure space, yet I felt exposed and violated. 
I spent the rest of my time there avoiding the room whenever possible, staying out late, and counting down the hours until I could finally leave. When I finally checked out, I reported the experience to Airbnb, detailing everything. His strange insistence on taking a photo of me with my passport, the camera in the room, the unsettling way he brushed off my concerns. I left a review warning others about what I'd encountered, hoping no one else would have to go through the same discomfort and violation of privacy. Looking back on the experience, I still feel that familiar wave of unease. It's one thing to deal with travel hiccups, misunderstandings, or even a rough check-in process, but to feel watched in a place that's supposed to be your sanctuary, even temporarily, was a level of intrusion I wouldn't wish on anyone. To this day, I triple-check every room I stay in, scanning every corner, every device, hoping that I'll never find myself reliving that unsettling stay. The last and only Airbnb I stayed in pretty much put me off the service for good. It was a nice place in a great location, from the look of the pictures. A friend and I were going to a concert in the area that night and drove in from out of town. After being on the road for hours, we were exhausted and starving. Once we settled in we realized, it was very obvious the house hadn't been cleaned since the last guest. There were small bits of garbage everywhere, dirty dishes in the sink, old food in the fridge. The advertised second bed was an air mattress with no sheets and the sheets on the master bed looked questionable. Then I made it to the master bathroom. There were dark, thick, curly hairs all over the bathroom floor. One of the sinks was clogged with cloudy water. The bathroom mirror was covered in flecks of toothpaste and debris. There was no hot water in the apartment. I told the property manager that the house was not acceptable and we would be booking a hotel for the night, and asked where to leave the key. I offered to accept a partial refund as I had taken a freezing cold shower and used one of their towels. The property owner refused and gave me an awful rating, accusing me of tampering with his property and expecting the experience of the Ritz Hotel. I sent Airbnb photos of the condition of the place. They gave me a full refund. We'd been planning this weekend getaway for what felt like ages, and when we finally arrived at the old farmhouse, it didn't disappoint. The place was straight out of a movie. Creaking wooden floors, sprawling farmland, and a wide front porch that stretched across the front of the house. The house had character, the kind that made you wonder about the people who'd lived there over the years. It was the five of us. Me, Jake, Clara, Max, and Sophie. We'd rented this place to escape our regular lives, a long overdue break to laugh, catch up, and just be ourselves. After settling in, we explored the main areas. The house had a rustic charm, with faded wallpaper, mismatched furniture, and a dozen little quirks. But one thing nagged at me, the place felt. Almost too big. It was as if there were parts of the house we couldn't see. I brushed off the feeling. Maybe it was just my imagination running wild in this old house. That night, after a long evening of stories and laughter, we decided to do a little exploring. Jake, who'd always been the most curious of us, found it first. A small, barely noticeable door tucked away in a corner near the back of the house. Hey guys, he called, motioning us over. Look at this. The door was hidden behind an old bookshelf, and it looked like it hadn't been opened in years. Without much hesitation, Jake twisted the dusty knob and pushed the door open to reveal a narrow staircase descending into darkness. The musty smell that wafted up was overpowering. Think we're allowed down there, Clara asked, a hint of unease in her voice. There's nothing about it in the listing, Sophie replied, glancing at her phone. Maybe it's just an old basement or storage. But curiosity got the better of us. One by one, we stepped down the stairs, our footsteps echoing as we went deeper into the darkness. The air grew colder, thicker, as if we were stepping into another world. At the bottom, the staircase opened into a dimly lit hallway lined with several doors. 
Each one was closed, their handles cold and tarnished, and the sense of mystery was intoxicating. Jake opened the first door, revealing a room that seemed straight out of the 1920s. An antique vanity with an oval mirror sat against one wall, its glass slightly warped with age. Elegant, fringed dresses hung from a wooden wardrobe, and a pair of worn, leather shoes sat by the bed. It looked like someone had just stepped out for a moment and would return any second. Clara's curiosity drew her to the next room. This one looked like it was from the 1970s, with posters of old rock bands on the wall and a record player in the corner. The bedspread was garish, bright oranges and yellows, and a stack of vinyl records sat beside it. As we explored each room, it became clear that they weren't just decorated in different eras. They were frozen in time. Old newspapers lay on the floors, notes and postcards littered the desks, and clothes hung in closets as if someone had been living there until, well, until they weren't. Drawn by some invisible pull, each of us found a room that seemed to call to us. Jake found a room filled with hiking gear, old maps tacked to the wall, and a compass resting on a small wooden desk. He was captivated, flipping through the notebooks filled with notes about trails and wildlife. I'd never seen him so enthralled. Clara was drawn to the 1970s room, where she leafed through vintage records and tried on old leather jackets, laughing as she held up a pair of bell-bottom jeans. Max stumbled into a room that seemed made for an old-school tinkerer, with shelves of tools, nuts, bolts, and an antique radio on the desk. He was the techie one of the group, so it made sense that he'd find fascination here. Sophie found a room filled with books. Old leather-bound tomes stacked haphazardly, a small desk with ink stains, and a writing quill. She sank into a chair, flipping through pages, as if they held secrets only she could understand. And then there was my room. It was decorated with old-fashioned art supplies. Paintbrushes, charcoal, canvases stacked against the walls. A half-finished painting sat on an easel, and something about it felt. Familiar like I'd painted it myself. It was eerie. Each room seemed tailored to each of us, as if it had been waiting for us to arrive. As we explored further, a creeping sense of unease settled in. The belongings in each room weren't just personal. They were intimate. I found notes scrawled on small pieces of paper in the art room, with names, dates, even diary-like entries. Clara found an old journal in her room, with the name Evelyn written in flowery handwriting on the cover. As she flipped through it, she read entries describing things she'd done in her own life. Like a stranger had written her thoughts and memories before she even had them. Jake discovered postcards in his room, addressed to Samuel, detailing hiking trips that sounded all too familiar to the trails he'd conquered. Every detail was eerie, unsettlingly close to his own experiences. Each room held memories. Of people who had stayed here before, people who seemed to mirror us in eerie ways. And each one of those guests had left their mark, their belongings left behind as if they'd simply vanished. The more we tried to piece things together, the more the house seemed to work against us. The lights flickered, the doors creaked, and the air felt colder with every passing hour. We tried to leave the basement, but the staircase seemed endless, leading us back to the same hallway, the same eerie rooms. Fear began to creep in, settling like a weight in our chests. We couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched, that something else was in the house with us. I swear I caught glimpses of shadows in the corners of my room, and sometimes in the dead silence, I'd hear a soft whisper, like someone was breathing just behind me. It was Sophie who finally noticed it. The rooms. They're not just rooms. They're... They're traps, she whispered, her voice trembling. These aren't just memories of past guests. They're like... Prisons made to keep us here. Her words sent a shiver down my spine, but as we tried to leave, the house seemed to change. The doors we'd come through wouldn't open, and the walls felt closer, pressing us back toward our designated rooms. Desperation set in. We ransacked the rooms, searching for anything that could help us escape. And that's when we found the letters. Old, yellowed papers hidden under the mattresses, 
taped to the backs of drawers, crammed into the darkest corners. The letters were from past guests, each one describing the same story, the same series of events, as if they had been trapped just like us. Some were pleas for help, others were simply last goodbyes. The final words of people who had come to this house, drawn by the same twisted curiosity. And in every letter there was a warning. The house doesn't let go. Panic gave way to helplessness as the hours wore on. We tried everything. Pounding on the walls, shouting for help, even attempting to break the windows. But the house held us in its grip, the room standing like silent sentries. It was Clara who finally gave up, settling into her 1970s room as if she belonged there. Maybe this is it, she murmured, her voice hollow. Maybe we were meant to stay here, just like everyone else. One by one, the others seemed to accept it too. Max sat tinkering with the radio in his room, Sophie curled up with her books, and Jake traced trails on the old maps in his. The rooms had claimed them. As for me, I went back to the painting in my room, picking up the brush, feeling a strange peace settle over me. The house remained silent, empty, waiting patiently for its next guests. And in those hidden rooms, our memories linger. Snapshots frozen in time, waiting to welcome the next group of curious souls who will stumble upon the forgotten staircase, unaware that they too will soon join us as shadows in this endless cycle. As a guest, I'm genuinely grateful the host never left me a bad review over this. It was Halloween a few years ago in New York City with four friends. One of them got super wasted before we even left the place, so we cancelled all our plans to take care of them. We felt like terrible friends leaving them behind to party in the city. The next day, after checking out, I got a message from the host saying someone had vomited in the dishwasher. The host even sent pictures as we couldn't believe it. The friend in question now a former friend refused to take responsibility and claimed it wasn't them. Nobody else admitted to it either. My best friend ended up paying the cleaning fee the host demanded in an attempt to keep the group's friendship intact, but by then I wanted nothing to do with that friend. Years later, I'm still angry they wouldn't own up to their drunken mistake and pay for the damages. As a host, we have pretty relaxed rules, but if you break the few we have, it's pretty much game over. On New Year's Eve, our house was booked out, and one of the two groups decided to break our no smoking rule. Weed smoke went into the vents and spread through the entire house. This was after we'd asked them multiple times to turn their music down and caught them sneaking in more people than they'd reserved for. They almost let our cats out after ignoring the don't leave the front door open, signs. Airbnb wasn't much help without finding us. It was a snowy New York Eve with minus 4 Fahrenheit temperatures, so we didn't want to kick them out, but we cancelled our own plans since we couldn't trust them alone in our home with our pets. We woke up the next morning to the smell of incense and found them hosting a yoga class in our living room, led by our guest. At that point, we kicked them out immediately. I'd booked the Airbnb as a quiet, isolated escape in the forested hills of Oregon. Work had been intense, and all I wanted was a few days in nature to recharge. The place was a cozy cabin surrounded by towering pines, the nearest neighbor at least a mile down the road. The first night passed peacefully. I made myself tea, read a little, and eventually drifted off, the cool night air lulling me into the most restful sleep I'd had in months. The second night, I was lying on the bed, scrolling through my phone, completely relaxed. The sound of the forest at night was a soft murmur around me, lulling me into a calm I hadn't felt in a while. And then, out of nowhere, a loud, jarring pop shattered the silence. I jerked up, heart pounding, as I realized the sound had come from my door. The lock had literally blown off, and the door had just burst open. My mind raced to process what was happening but I barely had a moment to think before someone stepped into the room. He looked like something out of a nightmare. 
or a noir film gone horribly wrong. A man, probably in his forties, stood in the doorway, clutching a strange canister in one hand and a shotgun in the other. He was Hispanic, with a bob haircut that was unsettlingly out of place. His face was obscured in the shadows, but I could see enough to know this wasn't a random local or a friendly neighbor. Paralyzed with fear, I sat frozen on the bed. My brain screamed at me to do something, anything, but I couldn't move. All I could think was that this man had a shotgun and that he'd already blown my lock open. I was sure I was about to die. The man scanned the room, his gaze falling on me, and for a moment I held my breath, certain that was it. The man's eyes narrowed as he looked me over, and then he let out a low grunt. Wrong room, he muttered, almost like he was talking to himself. He shook his head, his grip on the shotgun easing just a little. I couldn't believe it. Wrong room. How many rooms were there in this isolated cabin in the woods? I wanted to ask, to scream, to demand an explanation, but the fear in my throat made it impossible. I could only sit there, feeling trapped, as he stood there in the doorway. But just as he was about to leave, he stopped and turned back, his face still hidden in shadows. His next words were even more chilling than the sight of him in the first place. Do you see me? He asked, his voice low, almost a whisper. The question sent a chill down my spine. My brain scrambled to understand what he meant. Do you see me? It wasn't the kind of question you'd expect from a random intruder. There was something deeper, darker, hidden in those words. My mind raced to catch up, piecing together what he might mean. It dawned on me that he was asking for a promise. Not one spoken outright, but one understood between the two of us. He wanted to know if I'd keep silent, if I'd act as though he was never there. I cleared my throat, trying to keep my voice from shaking, and replied, No, I never saw you. The man nodded, satisfied with my answer, and turned away, his footsteps echoing as he disappeared into the darkness. For a long moment, I just sat there, stunned. It felt like the cabin was holding its breath, the quiet more oppressive than ever. My hands were trembling, my heart pounding so hard I thought it might burst. The silence that followed was so deep it felt like the entire world had stopped. Eventually, I managed to get up, my legs weak and unsteady. I locked the door, or what was left of it at least, and sank down onto the bed, mind still racing to process what had just happened. The fear lingered long after he'd gone, a deep unease that settled into my bones. Sleep was out of the question. I sat up all night, every creak of the cabin making me jump my mind replaying the scene over and over, dissecting every second, every word. By the morning, I was exhausted but alive. The sunlight streaming through the windows felt surreal, as though everything from the night before had been some kind of twisted dream. But the busted lock and the faint mark on the floor where he'd stood told me it had been all too real. When I finally felt safe enough to check out, I left without a word to anyone. I didn't tell the host about the busted lock, didn't mention the intruder. I wanted to leave that place as fast as I could, put it behind me. I didn't know if I should tell anyone. Part of me wanted to erase it from my mind altogether, as if by keeping silent I could make it disappear. But I knew that wouldn't happen. The memory was too vivid, too unsettling. So here I am, writing this. Because maybe it's a story someone else needs to hear. Or maybe it's just something I need to let go of. Either way, I survived that night, and I'll remember the face of that man in the doorway for as long as I live. And no matter where I go, I'll always check the locks a little more closely, just to be sure. The trip to Nice started off rough, and to this day, it still feels surreal. Me, my partner, and two of our friends had been looking forward to some time in the sun, drinks by the pool, and a carefree week in the south of France. But the moment we landed, the trip took a strange, almost nightmarish turn. Our flight was delayed, so by the time we finally arrived in Nice, it was already late. We hopped into a taxi to take us to our Airbnb, eager to get settled. 
But when we finally got to the place, the woman who managed the Airbnb refused to let us in, saying something vague that didn't make any sense to us at the time. We tried reasoning with her, but it was no use. She simply shut the door, leaving us stranded on the street with our bags. The cab driver, sensing our frustration, casually suggested we go into town and maybe even sleep on the beach if worse came to worst. It sounded absurd at the time, but we didn't have a lot of other options, so we took his advice and walked into the center of Nice, hoping to at least find somewhere we could rest until morning. That's when things got downright scary. As we made our way into town, we suddenly found ourselves face to face with armed guards. They were shouting at us in French, gesturing with automatic weapons, and none of us understood a word of what they were saying. We froze, feeling like deer caught in headlights, completely at a loss as to what was going on. We were English tourists who just arrived, clueless to any local news or events. It felt like something out of a movie. One moment we were looking for a beach to sleep on, and the next, we were surrounded by armed guards barking orders in a language we didn't understand. After what felt like an eternity, we were finally able to back away and made our way over to a stone bench near the Ministry of Justice, dragging our bags behind us. I sat down, gripping my backpack tightly, and tried to take it all in. I could feel the panic rising, and eventually, it got the better of me. I started crying as the sounds of shouting, sirens, and even gunshots echoed around us. It was chaotic, terrifying, and none of us had a clue what was happening. We must have sat there, tense and silent, for nearly an hour when a young man approached us. He was British, a student, and had been sitting nearby, observing us. It's usually busy in this square, he said quietly, but tonight everyone's gone because of the attack. We all looked at him, stunned. What attack? We asked, feeling a fresh wave of dread as we pieced together what he was saying. That's when he explained there'd been a terrorist attack just hours before. He'd overheard that we had nowhere to go, and seeing our distress, offered to call his Airbnb host to see if she'd let us stay the night. We were strangers in a city in turmoil, and he didn't owe us a thing, yet he went out of his way to help. Eventually, he led us to his Airbnb, a cozy place that felt worlds away from the chaos we'd just been in. When his host arrived later, she was visibly shaken. Her eyes were red, and she had a hard time keeping herself composed. The attack had shaken everyone in Nice. She explained that it was Bastille Day, and a truck had plowed through the celebrations along the promenade, killing dozens. The terrorist had been shot, and the ordeal had ended, but the shock waves were still rippling through the city. She was overwhelmed, worried about her friends and family, some of whom she hadn't been able to reach. She had even planned to see Rihanna in concert that week, but all events had been cancelled in the wake of the attack. We listened in stunned silence, our hearts breaking for her and the people of Nice. We tried to sleep that night, but uneasy doesn't begin to describe it. Every sound jolted us awake, every creak of the floorboards setting our nerves on edge. It was hard to grasp that we had only narrowly missed being in the middle of the chaos. If our flight hadn't been delayed, we might have been out on the promenade, doing what tourists do. Finding a pub, having a laugh, not a care in the world. The next morning, we thanked our hosts profusely and headed back to the Airbnb we'd originally booked. The sun was already beating down, and the city was quiet in that eerie way places get after a tragedy. As we made our way through the streets, all we wanted was a shower, a bed, and maybe a stiff drink to settle our nerves. When we finally met our Airbnb host, she was apologetic, explaining she hadn't been aware of the events the night before and refunded us some money. That took a little sting out of it, but nothing could have prepared us for what we found next. We got to our room, dropped our bags, and started to look around. It was a small, sparsely furnished place, but after a night like we just had, anything with four walls and a bed was a palace. We checked the storage spaces to see if we had enough room for our things. One drawer, however, caught our attention. Inside, mixed with some papers, were newspaper clippings and photographs of Adolf Hitler. We stared at each other, feeling a weird mix of disbelief and horror. 
It felt like we'd stumbled into some twisted alternate reality. We had survived a terrorist attack only to end up here, in an Airbnb decorated with Nazi memorabilia. As Brits, and as decent human beings, the whole thing gave us chills. We slammed the drawer shut, too stunned to even talk about it, and went straight for the pool to decompress over Sangria. The rest of the trip was subdued. We spent our days lounging by the pool, trying to unwind and shake off the surreal events of the past 24 hours. Yet, even as we laughed and tried to salvage our holiday, the sounds and sights of that night lingered in the back of our minds. Nice would forever be etched in our memories, not just as a beautiful French city, but as the place where we'd seen humanity at its worst, and its best. Looking back, it all feels like a dream. Armed guards shouting the kindness of strangers, and the horrors of history tucked away in a drawer. A young couple hosted us in their small London Airbnb. We slept there, and the next morning the couple was out for work. I opened a door thinking it was the toilets, but instead I saw a girl lying on a bed in a creepy room staring at me and not moving at all. I was petrified after closing the door, told my boyfriend, and we left few minutes later. Dad's work often took him to remote corners of the country, and this time, his trip brought him to a small, unremarkable town for a week. The hotel options were slim, so he found a small Airbnb listed as quiet private room in a quaint boarding house a few miles outside of town. It looked like an old Victorian home, with ivy crawling up the sides and shutters framing each window. The reviews weren't extensive, but the few that were there mentioned it was clean and peaceful, which was all Dad really needed. He didn't tell me much about the house when he called to let me know he'd arrived. He mentioned there were other guests, but assured me that his room was quiet. I was happy he was settled in for the night, though I couldn't shake a nagging feeling after we hung up. The next morning, Dad called again, and this time his tone was different. Quieter, more cautious. He told me he'd run into one of the other guests in the kitchen the previous evening. The man, a tall, rough-looking guy with tattoos running up his arms and a haunted look in his eyes, introduced himself as Joe. Did he seem? Off to you, I asked, not wanting to sound overly concerned but curious all the same. Well, let's just say Joe's definitely had an interesting life. But I figure, everyone has a story, right? Dad said, laughing it off. Throughout the day, Dad tried to stick to his routine. But whenever he returned to the house, he felt something was slightly off. He noticed a couple of other men who seemed to linger around the property. One sat on the porch, smoking and watching the street with a certain edge, while another leaned against his car in the driveway, eyes flicking back and forth as though he were watching for someone. A couple of days in, Dad found himself chatting with the house manager, a man in his fifties with a tough exterior and a gravelly voice. He mentioned that the property had been converted recently, explaining how there were shared spaces, and that the other residents stayed longer term than your average Airbnb guest. Dad, always the friendly type, struck up a conversation, asking about the house's history. The manager gave him a strange look before saying, this place, well, it's more of a transitional home for folks getting back on their feet. Transitional home, Dad repeated, his heart sinking as the manager's words began to sink in. Yep, the manager replied, his face softening just a bit. We get folks from all walks of life. Guys just out of prison, some on parole, some who've had it rough. But they're all trying to get a fresh start. It's a good thing, you know. Dad's smile was tight as he nodded, but inwardly he was rattled. The uneasy feeling he'd had since he arrived now made perfect sense. He realized his Airbnb, the quiet private room, was actually part of a halfway house for released criminals. From then on, Dad's stay took on a different tone. Every time he stepped out of his room, he felt the eyes of the other residents tracking him. 
There were strained nods in the hallways, murmured conversations he couldn't help but overhear, and the occasional piercing glance when someone thought he wasn't looking. One night, Dad found himself in the shared kitchen again, microwaving leftovers when he heard footsteps behind him. He turned to see Joe, the tattooed man from his first night, standing there with a grin that didn't quite reach his eyes. Long day, Joe asked, his voice rough and low. Yeah, you could say that, Dad replied, gripping his plate a little tighter. Joe chuckled and leaned in closer. So, you're just here temporarily, huh? Dad nodded, unsure where this conversation was headed. Must be nice having a place to go back to, Joe muttered before walking off, leaving Dad standing there, tense and wondering just how close he'd gotten to these men's struggles. That night, Dad couldn't shake the feeling that he was an intruder, that he didn't belong. The walls felt thinner, and the sounds of footsteps and low voices filled his room. Just after midnight, he heard muffled shouting from one of the rooms down the hall, followed by heavy footsteps storming past his door. He texted me to say he was okay, but admitted he hadn't been getting much sleep since he arrived. He was starting to feel like he was living with a level of tension he couldn't escape, and it was getting to him. The next day, Dad packed his bag early, determined to find somewhere else to stay for the remainder of his trip. But just as he was leaving, one of the men from the house, a stocky guy with a shaved head and piercing eyes, approached him in the hallway. Hey, leaving already? The man asked, blocking Dad's path. Yeah, work's calling me back, Dad replied, trying to keep his tone light. The man gave him a hard look before nodding slowly, stepping aside. Dad didn't look back as he made his way to the car, but he couldn't shake the feeling of those eyes on him, a lingering reminder of the week he'd spent under watchful eyes. Back home, Dad shared the experience with me, still rattled by the tension he'd felt living in that halfway house. He tried to laugh it off, but it was clear the week had left a mark. The sound of voices in the night, the piercing glances, and the close encounters had all reminded him just how tenuous the line between freedom and confinement could be. He realized how much he'd taken for granted. That week among men who had known lives very different from his own had been humbling, a reminder of the complexities we often ignore or overlook. And though it had been a brief, unsettling experience, it gave him a profound sense of gratitude, and maybe a bit more empathy, for those struggling to find their way back. Cheap rent. 650 per month one bedroom and home. This was the title of the Craigslist ad that drew me in. $650 a month for a bedroom. In Vancouver, that was dirt cheap. In fact, it was announced that the city was implementing affordable housing so for the low, low price of wedding $500 per month, you could have 385 square feet to call your own. Given the bleak state of the current housing market in the Metro Vancouver area, I immediately emailed the poster. The ad requested a quiet, single female. It also referenced that you should take good care of yourself, as this was a sign you'd take care of your living space. I was completely unfazed by this. Odds were that I'd be living in a house with other women who took good care of themselves, and like-mindedness is never really a bad thing, right? My landlord, Mr. Chu, asked for a photo. This again was weird, but by no means the creepiest thing to happen on Craigslist. I remember once hearing about an ad requesting a single female for free rent, but she was obligated to sleep with the owner once per month. I thought I could roll the dice and get a feel for Mr. Chu myself. Mr. Chu dressed very professionally. He was clean and well-spoken. He said he wanted a photo just so he knew who he was meeting in the busy Starbucks we chose for our first encounter. He explained that it was a three-bedroom home occupied by two other single women, Alexandra and Melissa. He said they were both quiet professional, and they didn't smoke. He told me he lived a few blocks from the house, and would pop by on average once every three months to check in. This all sounded normal, and we signed the tenancy agreement right there. The day I moved in I met one of my roommates, Alexandra. She was friendly and bubbly. She was explaining to me that our other roommate was a total introvert who kept to herself and hardly used the shared space. She joked that she'd grown accustomed to virtually living alone, but she was willing to share if I played my cards right. Alexandra was right about our other roommate. It wasn't until living there for five days that I ran into her. Her name was Megan. 
I remember that Mr. Chu had said her name was Melissa, but those two are easy to confuse. Megan said about two words and disappeared into her room. We didn't cross paths much after that. Mr. Chu came for his first visit exactly three months after I had moved in. He was cordial and just wanted to see how I liked the space. We chatted briefly about how things were going, my new commute, and how I liked my roommates. I told him that Alexandra was delightful, and that Megan seems like a nice girl, although I was starting to think she might be hermit. I gave a nervous laugh after that, feeling guilty for disparaging someone I hardly knew. Mr. Chu's expression briefly flickered from friendly to perplexed, but didn't let on that anything was out of the norm. He told me Alexandra was the model tenant, always early with rent and always chipper. He told me that Melissa he didn't know as well, but she was selected by Alexandra, so he felt she must have been a good fit. Megan, I corrected him. Megan. He nodded solemnly. About a week later, I was in the bathroom lighting candles about to draw a bath when Megan burst in. Sorry, she peeped and turned around and left. Not before I noticed some menacing bruises covering her legs. Dark, deep purple's bruises covered most of her legs. I didn't want to make an issue. I'd had problems with anemia before, and it might have been something as simple as an iron deficiency. Later that night, I was talking to Alexandra, telling her what happened. She laughed heartily and said, Maybe Megan likes it rough and just never let on. Don't judge a book by its cover, I guess. I laughed with her, once again feeling bad for discussing Megan despite never having had a real conversation with her. Well, now sleep. The reason I'm here is for your help. I think my roommate Megan might be crazy. Tonight she knocked on my door and left a gift outside. It was the new Taylor Swift CD with a note. Sorry about the bathroom, I should have knocked. Welcome to the house, hopefully you're a fan too. P.S. 2412621118 I have no idea what that means, and I'm too afraid to ask. What kind of crazy person would leave a note like that? Hello? My name is Tiffany. I live in California. I am 5 foot 1 and about 118 pounds. I have black hair. None of that matters though. You don't care how I look, what my favorite color is, or even what type of person I am. You just want to poke your nose into this little piece of my life and find enjoyment out of my terrible experiences. That's perfectly fine. Help me cope with the past. Just remember, every detail, no matter how small or irrelevant it may seem, is a pawn moving across the chessboard. Pay close attention. Let's start from the beginning. I love couches, but who doesn't? If I can find a Starbucks with a lounge couch, I can guarantee I'd be there for a couple hours. So, naturally, when I moved out of my parents' place and into an apartment in California, it took me quite a while to find the perfect couch. It couldn't be just any couch. It had to have big cushions that when you sat down, you immediately sank into your own little heaven. I came across a lovely little love seat on Craigslist, black puffy leather seats which could easily be reclined for nap time. The lady I picked it up from was a nice lady, probably in her fifties or so. She was right out of Ventura, so it wasn't a far drive at all. The ad originally said the couch was $300. I only had about $250 to spend on it, so when I arrived I asked if my amount would be okay. She nodded her head very quickly. The whole process was rushed and a little weird. She explained to me that her son had this couch for a long time, and since she was kicking him out, she wanted to get rid of it as quickly as possible. It's understandable using a site like Craigslist or FreeCycle, you're going to be paranoid about who comes to your house. But she kept looking over her shoulder back at the house like a kid sneaking cookies while mom's back was turned. Finally returning home, I had a classmate come over and help me get the couch into my apartment. Thankfully, I lived on the bottom floor, after getting it into my home, we decided to assess what condition it was really in. There was a slight tear on the back, but it wouldn't be noticeable at all since that would be against the wall. The only thing I was displeased with was that they had not bothered to clean it whatsoever before giving it to me so for the time being I cleaned it down with a wet rag, not really knowing how to clean leather. I also went out and bought a nice throw blanket and tossed it over. The first few months in Los Angeles were amazing. I had nothing tying me down and I was free to do whatever I pleased. I had a decent job, making more than enough to pay bills and have extra spending cash. As anyone else in their youth would do, I spent it on crap. Xbox systems, Blu-ray players, hookahs, takeout food, you name it. 
That all changed when I met Mason. Mason was the full package. Light blue eyes that sparkled when he smiled, and beautiful blonde hair. Mason took very good care of himself. Our budding romance was, at the time, the best thing to ever happen to me since I moved out here. He was quite charming, always leaving flowers for me in my kitchen when I wasn't home, so when I returned, I would be greeted with a beautiful bouquet and the sweet aroma of red roses. Cleek I know, but I loved it. Mason had taken me out to a hookah lounge in Hollywood one night, and then to dinner. He was so lovely like that. He explained to me that night that he had to travel for work, and would be gone for a few weeks so to make sure I would take extra precautions while he was gone. Always lock up and check the doors, he said. We smiled sweetly at each other before he drove off, leaving me in the darkness. I scurried up to my apartment door, fumbling for my keys. Snap. I whip my head around and strain my eyes, trying to see where the sound came from. In the darkness across the parking lot underneath a dim lamp, I could make out the silhouette of a man, his face caressed by the dim red embers of his cigarette. My heart dropped into my stomach. I turned back to my apartment door, and to my surprise it was unlocked. I flew inside, slamming the door shut behind me. I rushed to the living room and let out the most ear-piercing scream. The man was peering into my window, wide-eyed, with his hands cupped to the glass, cigarette in hand. He smiled at me, and what he said next still sends chills down my spine. Let me inside. Tears streaming down my face, I shook my head no. His smile slowly twisted into a series of harsh lines that formed a frown. He hit the window, slightly cracking it in the process, and backed away into the darkness. I dialed 911 and Mason as soon as he was out of sight. Mason arrived right before the police did and cuddled up next to me on the couch, which, over this short amount of time, managed to sink in quite a bit. The police arrived and everything was a blur after that. From what I remember, they greatly suggested that I let them do a quick search of my apartment, so I did. What they found that night continues to haunt my dreams over and over again. They moved my black leather couch, and there, underneath my couch, was a gaping hole in the floor. Upon further inspection, the police stated that it was a man-made tunnel leading to my apartment from a few bushes at the thick tree line across the street from my apartment. They found the man armed with three pairs of knives in this tunnel about midway through. A few months later they had given me a rundown on who he was. He was 36 years old and lived with his mother in Ventura doing basic architecture work for a living until he was kicked out a few months before they caught him. It was nice to have closure knowing I wouldn't ever have to deal with this sort of thing again. I moved into a new apartment shortly after the incident. Mason doesn't bring me flowers anymore. I decided to call him one night as I was walking up to my new apartment and ask him why he had stopped, thinking it was emotional stress. His response. Oh God. Victoria, I never left you any flowers. How would I have gotten in? I dropped the phone to the ground and started hyperventilating. Beautifully decorated on my kitchen table, was a lovely bouquet of red roses and a small white paper attached to a red ribbon. See you soon. I've lived in the basement of a public library in downtown for the past few days. Tonight I saw an advertisement on Craigslist. I hid in the dark storage space during the morning as I snuggled myself in the shadows. I leaned against the wooden frames of the colossal wooden crates as I hugged my knees which barely fit my small stature in between the narrow space. Pedestrians' footsteps and steam from the pipes howled as I drifted to sleep. Usually, I awoke in the early evenings. I did so to avoid attention. Not many of your kind think of me as eye candy. I stumbled to the dim lit stairs and climbed them. I felt wood splinter off the surface with each step as I scratched the steps involuntarily with my jagged black toenails. When I reached the top, I clenched my fist and lightly tapped my knuckles on the flimsy door. If I didn't hear any commotion or footsteps, I reached for the doorknob. I gradually twisted the knob and pulled the door open at a tortoise's pace. I turned to peek from it. The library was filled with an abysmal void above my head, while the floor showed flashes of trivial light from computer screen savers and a few dispersed emergency lights along the walls. This was the point at which I freely walked the halls. I spent my time collecting books of all genre and reading them by the few beacons of light that I was blessed to have. Tonight was different. I stared at the faded computer monitor in front of me as I looked at a faint reflection from the screen. 
My blue eyes had sunken into my pale, grimy face. My sweat-smothered black hair clinged to the sides of my filthy dirt-caked cheeks. My cracked lips failed to hide the growth of my dull, yellow fangs. I moved the mouse with my tiny hands as I searched the internet for a few hours. After my intensive study, I decided I was entitled to a break. Along the way I found an interesting site called Craigslist. I'm sure many of you have heard of it. I read through many boring advertisements until I came up on a post for pest control or plumbing. The description of the job was simple, as the owner of a nearby house in the city required both services and was willing to pay cash. Further details included a rat infestation with multiple leaking pipes. What struck me as odd was that the post also told the address. Nonetheless, I was fascinated about rats for dinner. Since the library didn't have food, I usually hunted stray cats and dogs on the streets near midnight, which was actually a lot of work. I made my way back to the basement and climbed my way out from the ledge window. The summer night was humid and warm. I crept from the bushes to the cool pavement of the sidewalk. Plenty of street lights illuminated the vacant streets, but I remained cautious. I ducked behind dumpsters or ran into alleys as several cars went through that part in town. It didn't take too long until I found the neighborhood in question. Overgrown lawns of tall grass swayed in the breeze as paper bags and needles littered the street. I noticed not many cars were parked in the neighborhood. In fact, many of the gloomy houses were gray as ash and covered with warnings on the doors. Their windows were broken or boarded. All of the houses were of this nature, except the last house on the lane. This house had a dark blue exterior with a renovated porch light. The door had a screen net that covered the entrance and none of the windows were broken. I knocked against the door, but no one responded. Perhaps they were too busy to answer. I noticed one of the windows on the second floor was ajar. I dug my claws into the wall and ascended to the window. I swiftly let myself in without a noise made. I heard someone snoring in the room, and as I approached the bed I noticed a heavy set, bald man was asleep. His older face didn't show wrinkles, however, his hands were full of them as he clutched the blanket. I figured I would let the man sleep, do the job myself, and be rewarded in the morning. I checked the living room and kitchen first, but I didn't find any rat droppings. I checked the bathroom as well, but no signs of rats were found. I didn't hear any rats in between the wall spaces either, so I decided I would have better luck finding the leaking pipes. I realized there was only a slight leak for the sink which I was able to physically clamp together with my bare hands. At first I thought I must have had the wrong address, until I realized the home contained a basement. As my eyes adjusted to the darkness of the basement, I noticed piles of what I assumed to be lawn equipment. There were stockpiles of polished saw blades neatly stacked in a corner of the room I guessed to cut the grass. Duct tape was located on a table with folded blankets and coils of rope. I guessed this was to fix up the nearby houses. At this point, I was very angry. I haven't had any rats to feast on, and this trip seemed like a waste of time. I double-checked the address and the location was correct. My stomach is grumbling as I finish writing this. I'm hoping this was all just a misunderstanding, and I'll be treated to a big meal like I was promised. Because either way, I am not leaving this house with an empty stomach. This was the first and only time I ever used Craigslist. It happened around five years ago in the spring when the snow had melted and the grass was growing long again. I went to my garage to get my lawnmower. I had an old push mower, and it hadn't been used for months. But when I tried to start it, it wouldn't work. I couldn't figure out what was wrong with it, so I looked online for help, but I couldn't find any solutions. I realized I probably needed to get a new lawnmower. The one I had was really old and had some problems before. My yard isn't very big, so I thought I could find a used push mower on Craigslist without spending too much money. After searching for a bit, I found one that looked like a good deal. It was priced at $100, which seemed fair to me. After thinking about it, I decided to contact the person selling it. I sent a text to the phone number in the listing and got a response about an hour later. The reply said that I could come and buy the lawnmower tomorrow evening if I wanted to. I agreed, and they gave me an address and a time to pick it up, which was 8 p.m. It was a bit later than I would have preferred, but I said yes. The next evening, I drove my small SUV to the address they gave me and sent a text to the seller telling them I was on my way. It took me nearly 20 minutes to get there, 
which was a bit farther than I'd hoped. When I got there, it looked like a regular neighborhood with houses on both sides of the street. I found the house number I was looking for. The garage door was open, so I parked my car on the side of the street. I texted the seller to let them know I had arrived, and I stayed in my car until I got a response about a minute later. The seller told me to come in. I got out of my car, walked across the street, and up the driveway. When I went inside the garage, it was quite dark because there was only one dim light bulb in the middle. I looked around, and there was a bunch of random stuff you typically find in a garage, but no lawnmower. I took a few more steps in and called out, but I didn't get any response. I noticed the usual step leading to the door that goes into the house, but then I saw another door in the far back right corner. This door was open and seemed to lead to another hallway. There was a piece of cardboard propped against the door, and someone had written lawnmower on it with an arrow pointing inside the door. I felt a bit confused and a little unsure about the situation, but I walked toward the door. As I reached the doorway, it was pretty dark and I couldn't see very well. I noticed there was a door to the right and a staircase leading straight down to what looked like a basement. The arrow on the cardboard pointed down the stairs, so maybe the person had their lawnmower in the basement for some reason. I started going down the stairs to the basement area. When I got to the bottom of the stairs, I could see that the whole basement didn't look finished, and the lighting down there wasn't much better. I still couldn't find the lawnmower, and then I heard a noise coming from upstairs. It was the door from the garage to the basement, and it was slowly closing. It didn't slam shut, but I heard it close. I looked up the stairs, but I didn't see anyone. The person who closed the door did it from outside the basement. I suddenly felt really uneasy and just wanted to get out of there. I hurried back up the stairs as fast as I could. When I was almost at the top of the stairs, I heard another door close, and then I heard footsteps. Someone else was in the house, and it seemed like they had come in through the other door from the garage. I tried to open the door, but it was locked from the outside. I couldn't get it to open, so I tried the other door that led inside the house, as it was slightly open already. When I got inside the house, I found myself in a small hallway. It led to a living room area with a sliding glass door that went out to a patio in the back. Then I heard footsteps coming from another room just around the corner. Without thinking, I went straight to the sliding glass door and opened it. Once I was outside, I quickly closed it behind me just in time. I saw a man coming into view inside the house. I didn't see him clearly, but he was walking towards me pretty quickly. I ran as fast as I could going from the backyard around the house and garage and back to my car. Once I got in, I started the engine and left right away. I drove all the way back home and blocked the phone number because I didn't want to have any contact with that person. I shared my strange experience on the Craigslist website, and then I decided to buy a new lawnmower from a store. Since then, I haven't used Craigslist again. I'm not sure if I'll use it in the future, maybe if things have changed. But what I do know is that I'll never forget that scary experience, and I hope nothing like that ever happens to me again. Last June, my guy edit. Boyfriend at the time and I were living with our roommates and my two kids. Our roommates decided to leave and only gave us three weeks notice on a month-to-month -month lease. We were already planning on leaving ourselves in a couple of months but with a short notice we decided that we just had to find a place somewhere, anywhere. Luckily, we both worked remotely, so we had the ability to move anywhere in the state. For two weeks, we searched every rental site on the internet that we could find. This eventually led us to Craigslist. Yeah, Craigslist. We had multiple rejections from landlords who weren't willing to work on deposit, which is understandable. However, one was open to the idea. She was a nice older woman in the state, with an approved realtor profile. I googled her. The house was perfect. It was a side-by-side -side duplex, which would be fine for a little while. Cute little kitchen and a backyard. The crime rate didn't look too bad and a school close by. She accepted large dogs, which was perfect, and the deposit wasn't too high. After some researching online and talking, we made arrangements to move into the home. When we left our old home, we took off to finally see our new humble abode. We dropped off the kids at my mom's for safety's sake and went on our way. The drive was awful. We were lost left and right and even nearly ended up in the wrong town. Eventually, we were able to find an ATM to pay for the rent and deposit. 
After getting lost and yelling at one another on the freeway for another 45 minutes in the middle of absolute nowhere, with limited reception and having to find a place to call her, we lost reception again, but we eventually found the gate where she met us to let us in. Something was off immediately. She seemed fidgety and nervous. She didn't look like her pictures. She kept wiping her nose with her sleeve, saying she was sick. She was a little older and maybe like she had been on drugs at some point, or maybe still. We went through the gate and drove about a half a mile down to her home. Apparently, her office was also her home. I didn't know that. The property was filled with old trucks, boats, and buses. It was like a graveyard for oversized vehicles. He looked at me completely frustrated. In his failed attempt at humor blurted out, Well, we're either going to get a house or we're going to die. Let's go find out. We parked and met with the woman outside. She seemed really, really anxious and was telling us random things about her many, many projects. I assumed tweaker. Sorry, but that's just what I assumed and it's a common problem in that area. We went inside the house, which strangely was well decorated and very modern. The rest of the house was a little trashy. She claimed that her office was flooded and we'd just have to sign the paperwork there. We agreed. We signed the paperwork. But when we realized we were missing $200, he felt secure enough to leave me to check the car to see if it was missing. She went on to tell me about the house and the arrangements. Random things. The key is by the light outside. They said there's a washer and dryer in the garage below. We don't know anything about that, but you might not want to go in there. It might be kind of icky. They also said there's a crawl space where somebody can get in. I'm not sure what they're talking about but just said to be careful and make sure it's okay. She was incredibly adamant about not having been at the home in quite some time. Okay. I realize that's the part where I should have definitely paid attention, but it was such a chaotic day and I was so exhausted that I just said, okay, sure. I shrugged it off. I just wanted to get the hell home. He came back inside and she said the missing amount was fine, so we could just tack on the missing amount to the next month's rent. Perfect. We thanked her and were on our way, new lease in hand. We picked up the kids and drove another hour to the home. The entire drive we were watching the miles down to the town and counting down. Fifteen miles, ten miles, five miles, then. We arrived. It was an old three-story building duplex. Not a two-story, but a three-story. The town was eerily depressing. Have you ever seen Gummo? It's a splitting image of Gummo. Actually, I lived in this same town as a kid with my dad sometimes. It was literally 1983. There were mullets and 1980s tank tops. Children playing outside, while their meth-addicted parents smoked on the porches and chugged cheap redneck beers like water. It was hot, but the sky was dark and gray. Even the power lines were hanging down and about to fall. There were drug addicts walking around and small children playing outside. Other children played by themselves, running their bikes through the streets unsupervised. This was not Mayberry. That beautiful yard had grown into a jungle. This duplex was practically abandoned, and nobody was living on the other side. My boyfriend and I looked at one another with a sense of dread. Is this it? I asked. This is it. This is where we live now, he told me. He grabbed the key by the light and we walked into the house. It was worse. The floor was covered in water. The fridge had been leaking for a while and the power wasn't on yet. We had called the company earlier that day and they said we would have to wait a week to turn it on. There was a cup of coffee left on the kitchen counter. I noticed the locks had been recently changed and the door had obviously been broken into several times, so much that the locks were completely useless. There was like this weird gap between the door and the frames. There was a horrible, horrible smell like the stench of rotting flesh or something. My boyfriend went to grab the things while I watched the kids. I walked in the living room. The house had been painted that day. It was roasting outside and the smell between the paint, the smell of mold and overwhelming smell of death. I had to open a window. I tried. He tried. The windows were broken and painted shut. The pictures online had to have been from a few years ago. This place was a train wreck. Whoever painted the house painted quickly and got the hell out of there. It was poorly done, even the door handles were painted. They painted the walls, ceiling, the banisters, and even the stairs this ugly, depressing salmon pink color. That instantly set me off. I think there was blood in here, I told my boyfriend. Why do you say that? He asked, dropping down more boxes onto the floor. 
That's the only reason to paint it this god-awful color. Blood will seep through white paint, eventually, and it's impossible to get rid of. The only reason I know this is because I remember hearing about a news story where a woman took over a murder house. As I walked further into the living room, I realized there was a huge bleach stain, about two feet wide on the dark carpet. The house was lifted so high with the garage or basement, whatever it was, below. I didn't understand how it could feel like it had been flooded or why the carpet was so badly wrinkled. We scoped out the house and went upstairs to the bedrooms. The windows were so low to the ground and hanging open and I just thought, this is not safe for kids. There was a bucket of paint with the paint roller still inside, randomly left behind in what would have been our bedroom. I stood by the window, which was only about maybe two feet high. It must have been about four feet tall, three feet wide, no guards, and was left completely open. There wasn't even a screen. I could have sworn I saw a flash of light while stared down three stories below from the death trap. Call it whatever you want, but I instantly had a vision of a woman with long hair falling out the window and crashing down on the ground below. I didn't tell my boyfriend. I had to get out from upstairs and just took the kids. About ten minutes later, that smell of death was making it impossible for me to breathe. I had to go to the bathroom. We had been driving for hours that day, but the moment I stepped in, I noticed the mirrored bathroom cabinets were cracked, left open and a toilet paper holder shoved inside in parts. I walked in a little more and I noticed the red spots on the shower walls and a sealed tampon in the middle of the floor. I don't think the maintenance man had any use for a tampon and it looked as though someone had gotten the hell out of there and did so quickly. I was about to go in, but something held me back and a little voice in my head said, don't go into the bathroom, so I didn't. My boyfriend was sitting in the car. He said it was too hot and he needed some air. I looked down below out the living room window and noticed that there were groups of people walking by and making comments about someone being in the house. Those people being us. I was trying to come up with every positive reason to stay here. I kept coming up with excuses like, it's not so bad. Maybe it just needs a woman's touch. Maybe some flowers will make it better. Maybe some air freshener. Maybe like 10 bottles of air freshener and a lot of bleach. I kept trying to convince myself by looking around and thinking how to make it work. I opened up the closet and then peeked inside to see that it led further down behind the wall. Keep in mind, this house was probably built in the very early 19s and is around 100 years old, if not more. It wasn't uncommon back then for secret rooms and passageways to exist. It's so hard to explain the feeling I had, but as I was about to peek around inside to see the back of the closet, something came over me. I knew that if I had gone any further, my kids and I wouldn't be alive. Everything felt so heavy and I was about to throw up. This was the closest I had ever felt in my entire life to not just death, but hell. Pure evil. I can't even possibly explain the amount of dread and discomfort. I was so uncomfortable. My son, who is always positive, came closer, excited and shouting, Is that another room? I full-on went pissed off Mother Bear, pushed him away and closed the door. Suddenly the words that the landlord had told me ran through my head again. They said there's a crawl space where someone could get in. Just then, I heard something else in the house. Something like someone moving around, somewhere around behind that closet area. I stood there for a moment and had the eerie thought creep into my head. You're all going to die here if you stay. That very thought set me into a panic, and with my heart pounding, I quickly grabbed my kids and ran out to the car. I could tell that my boyfriend was visibly upset with the home, giving me an opportunity to skip beating around the bush. Hey, let's just go, I told him. I was a little bit hysterical and I don't remember exactly what I said, but it was on the lines of, it will be fine. We will find something. We don't belong here. We need to get the F out. Let's just go. I don't care. I'm not mad. Let's just go. He was relieved. Neither of us wanted to disappoint the other, but after talking things through, it turned out we had the same feeling of dread and death in us. He was just afraid of dying as I was. I was absolutely positive that one night there would have killed us. I asked him to take pictures so that the landlord would know the situation. As we were leaving, we noticed that there was actually another window on our side of the duplex, which we believe was a secret room. I heard the neighbors across the street laughing and saying something like, it looks like they're leaving, that didn't last long. We slept in the car at a nearby gas station. We were so exhausted. 
I cried of course, and then called my mom to see if we could stay the night, but would have to wait until early in the morning. He did his best to comfort me, and we explained to the landlord that we didn't move in, that we had taken pictures, and there were multiple health code violations. We would send them if she needed them. She didn't even hesitate or want to see the photos, and within minutes offered to write a check for our money back. Bless her heart. I swear there was someone else in that house. It still terrifies me to talk about it, and I will never rent sight unseen again, and I'm sharing this story because you shouldn't either. By the way, that's not the end. That feeling haunted me for weeks, so much I couldn't sleep. Even my dreams were haunting me with the image of that woman falling out of the window. I eventually googled the address to find out who had lived there before us. I found a woman's name. I googled that woman's name and she's dead. She was beaten to death with a baseball bat, apparently stabbed, allegedly by her daughter and her daughter's boyfriend. They stuffed the body in a car for weeks after hiding it in a garage, and it was found a couple of hours away. I don't believe that the news story says that the murder took place in that house. I don't even know if but it still feels like it was involved somehow or something else happened. I'm not sure. I just know one thing. Someone is hiding something and I definitely believe that someone else was in that house. I buy a lot of stuff of Craigslist, but I don't sell that much because of the general idiocy I've encountered. It's buyer beware. Know your shit before you show up. But there are always sellers who say, someone else just offered me $50 more, or they simply don't bother to reply to email. As a habit, I try to pick out public places in open areas, but I'm a tall, big dude so I generally don't worry too much about the intimidation part of meeting someone but I try not to put myself into situations where I can't get myself out of either. I arranged to buy a broken Morley volume wah pedal the chrome optical pedal. Guy said it worked before a wire came off and the light bulb was burned out. We met on the street outside of his apartment building and wouldn't you know it, he didn't bring it with him. But the guy smelled like pot, so I wasn't too worked up over it. So I followed him up three flights of stairs and when he opened the door, it was like a bad Cheech and Chong movie. I mean, what's the worst that can happen? The guy can't remember where the parts are. I stand outside of the apartment door in the hallway, and he's looking around and I hear tires screeching outside. There's this boom, and all of a sudden a platoon of cops in riot gear are storming up the stairs. The guy shows up with a couple of handfuls of parts, screws and drops the bottom plate. I pick it up, get the stuff and give him the money. As I'm going down the stairs, the last cop pushes me up against the wall and points a gun in my face, shouting, What apartment were you in? I'm like, Dude, I'm just buying a busted-ass guitar pedal. I don't know what apartment I was in. The cop looks at the parts in my hands and looks back up at me. He sneers and pushes me down the stairs as he takes off running up to catch up with the others. I jumped into my truck and drove away. No tires spinning and or anything dramatic, just like I'm supposed to be there and I'm supposed to be leaving. I don't know where those cops were going or what they were going for or anything except that all the pedal needed was a wire soldered backup and a new bulb. A MacBook I bought on 2010 almost got me fired from my job. I scheduled a meeting with a fellow doucher 69 at a Starbucks to sit down and review a MacBook that I wanted to buy. I meet him, it goes fine, we make small talk while I review the computer. I made the unfortunate mistake of telling him I worked for the cable company. He proceeded to tell me of his internet problems, to which I said I would look at his account when I got back to work. He said he had extended coverage on the computer, but that he had forgotten the paperwork. He would be in contact with me when he found it, and we would meet up to make the exchange. I paid him, we shook hands, and I went on my way. That night, I open up the computer and find that he has not formatted the computer, but simply removed all of his applications. In the contacts application, there is his name, address, and phone number. I write it down in case I ever need to get in contact with him again. I format the computer and install the latest OS on it. I send a text to Doucher69, letting him know that he left his info on the computer, and that I live close to him and if he ever finds the warranty paperwork, to let me know and I can swing by and pick it up to make it easy for him. The next day, I pulled up his account to review his repair call history. I didn't find anything of value, and I didn't really care to help the guy beyond normal troubleshooting, 
so I closed out of his account and forgot about it. The next morning, I get a call from HR to come down to their office. They inform me that Doucher69 has called into management and inform them that I unlawfully accessed his account to get his personal information. His wife and child are scared that I might come after them. They also are certain that I have stolen their bank account information. Upon initial investigation, HR has found that I did in fact access his account. At this point, I worked in it, and I had no official business touching customer accounts. HR asked me to show on the computer where his personal info was, but at this point, I had formatted the computer. I was done. This sort of complaint is taken very seriously, and rightfully so, but I was completely, 100% innocent. I was dead where I stood. I knew it. HR sends me home. This is a Friday, and they tell me to wait for their call on Monday afternoon while they investigate and decide what my fate is. At this point in time, my wife is eight months pregnant and unemployed, so I am the sole income to what is about to be a family of three. I was terrified and felt completely powerless. It was one of the most stressful, long weekends of my life. I couldn't sleep, I couldn't eat, it was constant worry and regret. I sat down at my cursed MacBook and wrote out a letter of explanation to my boss, my director, and to HR. I detailed our entire interaction, include when and where, provided copies of all text messages before and after the purchase, and did my absolute best at explaining the situation from my perspective. It was a Hail Mary, and it worked. I was well-liked at this job, and people came out of the woodwork to support me my boss, my boss's boss, previous bosses, all came to my rescue and stood up for my character and work history. It felt awesome. HR sided with me, however. I was to never contact the customer again. It didn't matter if the computer turned out to be a fake, messed up. Whatever do not contact him ever again. So I didn't. I worked at that job another three years until April of this year when I got a new job and moved out of state. The story was somewhat legendary after that. I should have been fired. 95 times out of 100. HR would have fired any other person on the spot. I have no clue why I was the exception, but I was and I was thankful for it. After my last day at the cable company, I really wanted to sit down and write a long nasty letter to this guy. I got on Facebook and composed a message, but I chose not to send it. I have no clue what his motivations were or why he did it, but I had moved on from it and saw no value in confronting him. Lessons learned never give out your name, Use Google Voice to send your texts and never tell them where you work. Review the product, purchase, and leave. That's it. It was a few weeks before my junior year of college, so this was 2010. I wanted to sell an old couch from my previous house because we were getting two new roommates and they already had couches. I posted the ad and 15 minutes later I got an email. The guy said he would pay 75 for the couch I had listed it at 100, but would bring some Xbox games to trade to make up the difference. Okay, nice. So he pulls up in a truck with two women in the bed. I insist on helping him get the couch outside, but he says no and has the two women do it. Then it gets interesting. He says he only has $50, but if I took the money, he would give me one the girls for 20 minutes. Keep in mind he told me this as the couch is sitting in his truck. I didn't know what to say. I took the $50 and said to just leave. He was insulted for some reason and threatened to come back and beat my ass and rob me blind. We moved to our new house the next day with our new roommates. Fast forward a month, I read in my school's newspaper, and on the front page was a picture of my old street with the headline, Man Arrested Intimidating Students at a Party with a Crowbar. My old residence, I read on. His name was Bruce and his criminal background included 17 misdemeanors and a drop death assault and attempted kidnapping charge. Also, just as icing on the cake, he was also wanted in Ohio on numerous stalking charges. Craigslist. Never again. Thanks for listening. If you like our work, do subscribe because your support helps us keep this channel alive.